and welcome back to the Wellness Paradox podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap that exists between fitness and wellness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences, all in an effort to give fitness and wellness professionals the skill they need to be a part of our healthcare delivery system. And to do that in episode 46, I'm joined by Jeff Burns for a fascinating discussion on wearable technologies. It seems like nowadays we can literally instrument every part of our body. But as we're going to talk about in the podcast, not everything that we can measure matters. And this is quoting Jeff, not only everything that matters can be measured. And I think that's interesting context. And and the word context is, is definitely going to be what this discussion is focused around because just because we can get data does not mean that that data is actually valuable for us in the real world and practical context with the clients and patient populations that we work with. And and Jeff is really going to unpack that for us in this conversation. We're going to talk about heart rate. We're going to talk about calorie expenditure. Moreover, we're going to talk about a lens through which we can filter our analysis of wearable technologies through. I think this is an absolutely fascinating conversation, and it very well may leave you with more questions rather than answers at the end of the discussion. But I think that just generates more exciting thoughts and potentially research in the future. Any additional information we'd like to share from this episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode four six. Please enjoy this conversation with Jeff Burns. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Jeff Burns. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us on The Wellness Paradox. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to, excited to talk to you. This is going to be a great discussion, and this is a discussion on wearable technologies. And like I just said before we got on the air, I feel like this could be 10 hours worth of content, not 45 minutes. So I want to dive right in, and I, I want to dive into this discussion, just a little bit of context for our audience. Can you, can you give us an idea of your background? Yeah, so I am a sports science researcher at University of Michigan, a postdoctoral research fellow here. Um, My expertise is in running biomechanics physiology, um, but broadly speaking, I I work with, um, yeah, a lot of different aspects of of sports science and performance improvement. Uh, Before I did, I did my PhD in kinesiology here at University of Michigan. Ron Zernike was um, my supervisor. Um, and I still collaborate with him regularly. Um, he's looking out for me in my postdoc. <laughs> um, and then before that, I actually studied biomedical engineering here at Michigan as well. So I did a bachelor's and a master's degree in, uh, yeah, in biomedical engineering. And I, and then after that, before starting my PhD, you know, circuitous timeline here, um, I, I worked in the medical device field as a validation engineer. Um, for St. Jude Medical. They make cardiac, well, now they've since been bought by Medtronic, but cardiac pacemakers leads. Mm-hmm. Engineer for them. Then I came uh, back to Michigan after doing that for a little bit and worked as an engineer for orthopedic surgery, supporting the surgeons and residents in their biomechanics research projects. So engineer there and then then did my PhD where I focused on running running science. And, and a lot of my research has been on um, say, largely speaking, ground reaction forces and kind of modeling runners as systems and and doing different analytical techniques to study how we run. Um, But then along the way, I've done a lot of different research projects in different sports from, you know, from running to, to basketball to kind of some, you know, some wearable tech, stuff like that. So, so yeah, so broadly speaking, um, an engineer and scientist uh, with a nod towards sport performance. Yeah, we're going to get into some of that wearable conversation here. But before we leave your own personal background, in terms of running, uh, running is not only something you study, but it's also something that you have a passion and a talent for. Do you just want to touch on that real quick? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, um, you know, I, I am an, I am an athlete, um, myself and I, I compete internationally in ultra marathons. So I've represented the U S in the world championships over 50 kilometers and hundred kilometers, um, placed top 10 in the world, um, three times and then twice placed fifth twice <laughs> in the hundred K. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so and then have also raced in other overseas, like Comrades Marathon is it's a 56 mile race in South Africa. That's huge. It's kind of like the Boston Marathon there. Um, so I've done, you know, finished as the top American there. Um, so, yeah, so I, I in addition to my studies of running, I, I, I really live it in, you know, both my my day to day life in terms of moving through training um, and then also, you know, runners I interact with and whatnot. So, so, yeah, the competitive competitive side of it is very much, um, one of the fibers of my being. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. You definitely practice what you preach. And I didn't want to get into this conversation without at least acknowledging that. So thank you. Tell me a little bit more about the exercise and sports science initiative at Michigan. Uh, what's its mission, its plans, it go its goals. I don't think a lot of people know about this, but it's something that they should know about. Yeah. So the exercise and sports science initiative, SE as we call it, um, was started by Ron Zernike, who, who I then came in to do my PhD with. Um, it was actually, I think he started it, get the dates wrong, but it was, it was, I'd started my PhD in 2016. Um, I think they, they launched it a few years before that. Um, and, uh, it, it's, its mission really was to unify sports science and performance research here on campus because, you know, Ron was coming out of being the Dean of kinesiology. Um, and he has a you know, long track record in, in biomechanics and sports science, um, uh, research activity. Um, but he kind of saw this gap at, you know, Michigan, which is this world leader in research world leader in athletics. Um, and, and this gap of like, why, why is there no unified, you know, sports science program here? Because yeah, kids come here from all over the world. Researchers come here from all over the world because they love, you know, they're they're drawn to the like intellectual excellence and unified around the athletic excellence. And so it's kind of this, it seems almost like a no brainer, but for the better part of 200 years yeah. at the university, there wasn't that. Um, so Ron, Ron really set out the mission of this, this initiative to unify not just kinesiology, but kinesiology and athletics, but then all other um, uh, you know, schools, colleges, disciplines around campus. So you know, Ron, Ron sits in both biomedical engineering, orthopedic surgery, and kinesiology. Mm -hmm. And that was really kind of his mission of taking you know, medicine, science, um, and you know, all other research activity on campus, bringing in athletics. So it's kind of that um, an initiative to unify groups across campus um, to do sports performance research. And we've done, you know, in addition to, you know, some of the different running related stuff that I've done, there's been activity on the, you know, on sleep, uh, nutrition stuff, um, uh, trying to think of some of the other going work with the basketball team and football team doing, you know, load monitoring, stuff like that. Um, so there's just been a, a wide variety of, of, you know, researchers pulling in from, and certainly engineering, there's been a different, different projects, football helmets, um, different like swimming sensors, um, stuff like that. So, yeah. So projects all over campus coming together, um, under one. It does, it does seem like a no brainer, but certainly academia is, is known for its silos. And it's, ex it's exciting to hear that those silos have been broken down. That's a lot of what the thesis behind this podcast was all about is, is breaking down silos. And I think that's, that's fascinating. And then we'll link up to uh, information on the exercise and sports science initiative at Michigan in the show notes, just so people have a chance to check it out. But really where I want to go with our discussion today is around wearables. Wearables are so ubiquitous now in the fitness and the wellness space. It seems like every day I read another article about a new watch, a new ring. Uh, I was reading an article last week on uh, smart hearables headphones that uh, had sensors in them. It just seems like this space is exploding. And certainly the pandemic has caused the pace of this industry to even accelerate. But 
I think what's fascinating about all these devices, Jeff, and we, we've, we've talked about this, is that they're all based on scientific algorithms that drive their data outputs. And I think we just kind of as a as the general public that doesn't know any better, or even fitness and wellness professionals, we just take that data that these d- devices produce at face value and we don't ask any questions around them. And I guess this podcast today will be designed to ask some questions around these devices. And the first question that I want to ask you, because you've been intimately involved in this, is what's the algorithm process look like for the development of these technologies? Like, Take us under the hood when someone's trying to develop a wearable and actually help us understand what they do to go from wearable device to output to a user that they're able to do something with. Yeah, great question. And there's there's a lot of a lot of steps along the way for that. Um, so I guess maybe the be- le- best place to start might be just to take a simple example and then walk through. So okay. when we talk about devices and, and algorithms, um, let's think about Mm, uh, let's take the Apple watch that, that, you know, a lot of, a lot of your listeners might be wearing, or, you know, the same is going to go for, um, you know, a Garmin. So Mm -hmm. that's what I wear. It's my, my weapon of choice when I'm training. (laughs) Um, but yeah, so, so a watch. And then, I mean, within, (laughs) within that, there are an enormous amount of different outputs, but let's take it's, it's the, the single functionality is the heart rate monitor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So your Apple Watch as a kind of fitness monitor, um, you know, relying heavily on that optical heart rate monitor. Mm-hmm. So what's it look like, you know, and, and its output is going to be certainly your heart rate, but it also is aiming to give you calorie counts and, and energy expenditure. So in terms of developing that technology and, and giving it to the user in kind of a yeah, meaningful form, you have several steps. The first one is getting, getting a good heart rate signal. Okay. And for, you know, gold standard for heart rate is going to be like an EKG. Um, and then just below that gold standard is, is a good chest strap. So, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of your listeners might be familiar with your canonical heart rate monitor chest strap. And those, those actually both rely on kind of the same fundamental physiological principle of picking up the electrical signal of your heart rate. And a good chest strap is actually, quite, I mean, most laboratory studies use those instead of EKG, because mm. EKG is so cumbersome. Um, so so that's that's the first step in developing one of these technologies is, is if you have the piece of information that you want to give the consumer, so in this case, it's the heart rate and then ultimately the calories, um, you need the gold standard against which you are going to be testing that. So Apple wants to measure your heart rate from your wrist, not using a chest strap, it needs to be validated against the gold standard of that chest strap. It needs mm-hmm. to match it well. Um, so, so yeah, so the first step is, is kind of developing that technology and, and what heart rate monitors use that are on the wrist or what's called pulse oximetry. So I'm sure a lot of your listeners might be familiar with the little things that you put on your finger and it measures it. So what mm-hmm. that actually measures is um, the pulses of blood that go through your vessels they have different reflectivity when you shine a light on them and the light shines back. So deoxygenated versus oxygenated blood reflects differently. Um, so that's kind of the underlying scientific principle. So, you know, they figured out that you could essentially do that on your wrist and, and measure those pulses. And so that's the first step in the algorithm development is, is using a pulse oximeter on your wrist to try and measure that heart rate signal. And that in itself is then there's a lot of like engineering under the hood of getting that right, of doing all the signal processing, what cases it works, what cases it doesn't, um, and then spitting a nice pretty, pretty number out on your screen. And so all the while that you're doing that, you're trying to get this really clean signal from the engineering inside the watch. And then once you think you've got it, you're then validating it back against, you know, the known standard of the mm-hmm. chest strap. And you're kind of iteratively doing that process. So you get something that that's clean um, or seemingly clean in, mm-hmm. in one case. And this is the other very important part and different manufacturers. And this is true of all different devices. The cases on which they do that validation mm-hmm. are going to vary and will affect the quality of your, 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 um, your readout. 
Mm-hmm. So what I mean there is um, if I have a chest strap on or an EKG and I've got a watch on one hand that's reading the heart rate from the, the chest strap and then my Apple watch on the other that's reading it from my wrist and I'm looking at them when I'm sitting down and we got it, you know, we got our software ironed out on the watch to measure it well and the numbers are lining up, that means it's valid in that case. Mm -hmm. But the critical thing is if I get up and start walking around, is that going to throw everything off? Does that, you know, does how, how tight my watch is like affect that signal? Um, does, you know, what I'm doing with my wrist affect it? And that's a big, that's actually a big case in, in running where like a lot of running watches, Apple watch included have those, you know, reading your heart rate from your wrist, but because it's measuring the reflectivity of that light, it can sometimes pick up your arm swing instead, mm. which then appears as your cadence. So mm. it gets confounded. So all of this is getting back to say you, you're constantly trying to validate against a gold standard when you're developing it um, and seeing the extent to which it's um, reliable against that. And then you're ideally trying to then do it in a variety of contexts and really iron it out. And I think that's where the, you know, the quality of, of wearables and their accuracy breaks down on those two fronts of, of A, how good and consistent is it against the gold standard? And B, how good and consistent is it in a variety of use cases? And so those are two kind of very critical things that vary a lot from device to device. And that's great. And what's clear from that explanation is this is, this is a complex process that is undertaken. And there's all kinds of things that we can dive into in terms of generalizability based on your population. Uh, Not that I want to go down this rabbit hole, but I know with uh, the optical sensors in wrist-based heart rate monitors, there's, you know, questions of validity and reliability based on skin tone and pigmentation and things like that. So there, there really is a lot to consider here. And I like a, a deep, scientific dive as as much as the next guy, but I want to make sure we pull it to something that is very practical. And again, there's so many wearables out there now, Jeff. It's like you literally, I feel like we can instrument like every part of our body at this point and derive some kind of data from it. So can you talk to the fitness and wellness professionals that are listening right now about the utility of some of the measurements that we're getting from these devices. You know, what's what information do you feel it can be very valuable for fitness and wellness professionals? And where are some of the limitations at the margins where the research isn't just quite there yet? I realize that's a broad question, but this I feel like this is such a broad topic area that I, I want to make it broad. Yeah, no, that's a that's actually a great question. That's probably like the most important question yeah, you can ask. Right. Because it it gets back to this, you know, what you said we could measure everything in our bodies. And right yeah. now, um, right, right now we're definitely at a point where with this explosion of technology that we can measure a lot more than, than like we can do with. And, and I think a lot of times we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of, um, hammers looking for nails, mm. uh, in the, <laughs> yeah. So, and, and this, you know, one of my fundamental as an athlete, as a researcher, you know, kind of one of my fundamental theses is not everything that you measure that you can measure matters and not everything that matters can be measured. Okay. And so one of the important things to ask with these is, you know, yeah, what, what, what matters for a fitness professional? And, and I think to ask that you, there are kind of say two, two lines of thought that you should go down. One is there evidence in the literature for the gold standard version of that measurement to be efficacious for health outcomes, performance outcomes? So, you know, if you have a, a, a wearable tech that is purporting to do, you know, some sort of kind of lab based thing the same or, or give that output, the first thing you need to ask is even if I were to have the best possible measurement of that, is it, does it actually have evidence to be useful? And so that that's number one. And then number two, um, yeah, you have to, you then have to ask what, if the, um, the context in which you're measuring it is, is valid. And if it, if it is even a valid measurement or, you know, reliable and that, that might come from, you know, leaning on, you know, scientific studies done on these, um, seeing if there are any, any lab based validation. So 
uh, again, let's get back to maybe some examples. Um, heart rate, you know, from a watch that, you know, if it can do it on your wrist and it's doing it accurately. And, and I will say a lot, a lot of these wrist-based heart rate monitors, <laughs> if you wear them tightly, um, and they, they actually do perform pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, now the calorie account that they give you, that's another question. And that was, that was going to be the second part of the yeah. uh, algorithm development side that don't get in the weeds on that. That might not be so accurate, but the heart rate, the heart rate is good. And heart rate is something that we know in a massive amount of use cases is very helpful for exercise prescription. So that's an example of like, yeah, if I have a gold standard of heart rate in the lab, if I'm using a chest strap or an EKG, um, that can really help me tailor, you know, cardiovascular, um, exercise prescription and monitor that in myself or my clients, my athletes, whatever. So that's a, you know, a good use case on the flip side, another, you know, another item that we're seeing a lot, like in the running world are these different biomechanical sensors. So like Garmin has some that, you know, it's this running pod that me measures like vertical oscillation, um, uh, all sorts of other, you know, stride characteristics, things like that. Um, and this is something that a lot of people look at and think like, oh my gosh, like we can measure all these characteristics of the movement, but there actually really is not much literature to support that any of those characteristics are linked to injury risk or anything mm -hmm. like that. Moreover, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that trying to change them, especially consciously is injurious. Yeah. So this idea that like, we now have these, you know, this sensor that you could clip on your waist belt that gives us this output that again, like if I go back to the lab, the gold standard in the lab would be doing that on a force plate, you know, underneath a treadmill or something like that. If I did that in the lab and got these numbers, I don't know as they would give me any, you know, they, there's no, there's not much evidence to suggest that they would be useful. So let alone taking a noisier technology and using it. So I think going through that process of like, is it, is it, if I had the best possible version of this, is it useful? Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, that kind of, that's, two examples of one that's, you know, something that you can measure that that does matter. And another one that's, you know, something that you can measure that doesn't really matter that much. And then, then that kind of gets back to the other half of that is, is the other things that do matter, like, uh, you know, especially in, in running, like you're, I think about the ultimate performance. So the number, number on the clock, when you finish, finish mm -hmm. a race, so your performance, that's what matters. And there are a lot of things that go into that, that you can't really measure mm -hmm. that determine that performance. And, and I think a lot of times using too much data can distract you from kind of reading the synthesis of things going on in your body to get to that ultimate performance. So if the data is, you know, if the data matters, it can be helpful, but if it, if you don't know if it matters or you don't have evidence for it, I think it can actually be a little distracting and, you know, from getting, getting to the ultimate, the ultimate thing that matters if that's, you know, performance or health outcome. Yeah. It almost becomes paralysis of analysis. At some point, you have so much data to look at and you know, commercialization drives the desire for data. I make no mistake about it. Garmin and Nike and Apple and all these companies, I, I think they're well-intentioned, but their job is to be profitable and sell products. And so they, they want to make this data seem desirable. I do have a question and I don't want to go too deep into it, but I think it's an important thing for us to talk about because as you said, you know, not everything that we can measure matters and not everything that measures can uh, matter. And I think that the calorie thing is an interesting discussion. And again, I, I don't want to go too deep down this rabbit hole, but I can tell you being in the, the fitness industry for 23 years, people live and die on that calorie number that they burn. And there's so many ads out there for burn a thousand calories in a workout. And you know, some businesses have gamified their entire enterprise around this. Just talk for a second about what we really know and probably more accurately what we don't know about quantifying energy expenditure with exercise. Yeah. So um, quantifying energy expenditure from, from our, our activity is um, what we do know is that there are, we have, there is an enormous amount of data on, on different exercise modalities and, and population averages for different things that we do. Um, you know, so, and, and so there are, there are a lot of equations that you could kind of plug in 
and get a good or get a get an approximation for your 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 calorie count and but that's that's in very constrained exercise Mm -hmm. settings yeah so there are a lot of again a lot of accurate ways to estimate from your you know your height and weight if we know those you know broad characteristics about you if you get on a treadmill and run we could give you a pretty good ballpark you know within plus minus 10 percent of probably how many calories you burn doing that same thing with riding a bike or even swimming or well swimming might be a little noisier but um but so anyway so there are a lot of things that, that like are well established in the lab that we could plug in equations and get pretty close problem is those massively change once you go outside the lab because all the nuances of your activity that do not go on can affect that so we have these equations from years and years of research to give you kind of an accurate estimate but then how those translate into your actual living is a little bit different moreover they those equations are very good for estimating that in a large group of people Mm. but not necessarily you specifically so when I said plus minus 10%, like for plus minus 10% on a lot of things, then like if you stack tons and tons of activities on each other, you can get very noisy outcomes. Um, so, so yeah, so in terms of estimating energy expenditure, once you start combining activities with varied individual responses to that, you start to get big fluctuations in, in those estimates. Um, and I mean, <laughs> and then you know, to layer on top of that, this gets back to the algorithm development is every single device is going to try and figure out different ways to piece those different equations for estimating. You know, if I think you were running at a low intensity here versus walking here, um, you know, those two things, we could estimate your energy expenditure in the running and the walking really well, but how they interact and the kind of decay in the energy expenditure, all of those things are very individualized. So, that, that becomes very noisy. And so what that looks like is like, I, you know, a lot of times when I run, I'm wearing actually two watches. Cause I'll be doing like different validations on different devices. Um, my two different garments give me wildly different, uh, calorie estimates for mm-hmm. a given run. And that's a very simple run. Like that's just one activity, but because I'm changing paces and, um, all these different, different features of my run, there are different ways to account for that. So, yeah, so I think the the way that the energy expenditures are are estimated, it's gonna be it's gonna be very individualized, um, and so it's it's hard for yeah it's hard for a device to to really capture the nuance in your own your own metabolism. Um, yeah, I'd like to take a quick break from today's episode to tell you more about one of our sponsors. As all of you are well aware the COVID-19 pandemic has been absolutely devastating for the fitness industry, with upwards of one-third of our clubs closing nationally on a permanent basis. One of the few stabilizing forces during this very tumultuous period of time has been URSA, the National Trade Association for the Health and Fitness Industry. On my crusade to make fitness professionals part of our healthcare continuum, the work that URSA is doing is absolutely vital. They provide advocacy and lobbying support at both the federal and the state level. They support state alliances in many ways, and they also provide resources and best practices to club owners, operators, and individual fitness professionals. Indeed, if we are truly going to become part of the healthcare continuum, we must speak with one unified voice. We must have best practices that we implement, and we must come together as an industry to ensure the public, the medical community, and lawmakers hear our message loud and clear that movement is medicine and it is essential. That is the work that URSA is doing. They've recently revamped their membership structure, allowing large clubs, small clubs, boutiques, and individual professionals to join the organization for an appropriate price that allows them to have access to all of these many great resources and allows us to unify and amplify our voice as an industry. For more information on the amazing work that URSA is doing, go to their website, ursa.org. That's I-H-R-S-A dot org. I-H-R-S-A dot org to look in a little bit further into the work URSA is doing to unify our industry 
to move us closer to being a part of that healthcare continuum. Now back to today's episode. Again, I think the, the, the answer to many of the questions on this episode, like most questions in life are, it depends and it's complicated, but yeah. I think to, to get specific and to give people a little bit of an actionable takeaway, particularly with regard to the calorie thing, because it is really put on a pedestal uh, unnecessarily, but nevertheless on a pedestal is like one of the critical metrics of exercise success. How should people view that? calorie expenditure measurement? Is it something that if you're using the same device, it might not be valid, but it may be reliable in that, you know, it might not be able to tell you that you burn 300 calories on the dot, but if you burn 300 on your workout today and 350 tomorrow, there's a good chance you burn more calories on that workout tomorrow than today. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that that's, that's a, um, that's a, that's a good rule of thumb. And it's also, you know, it's also worth I would say worth estimating, um, like if, if you're using the same device, it probably means you're doing the same activity roughly. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, and so I would say that the, it might be valid within an activity. If, if that's me saying I burned 300 calories running on my Garmin watch and then I go swim or I wow. go, yeah. or I go like elliptical and my Garmin watch says 350. I don't actually know if that's a valid comparison because it has these estimations for different modalities. I, I think that like, if you're using the same, if you're doing the same activity, you could actually, if it was me, I would go find estimations for that activity or better yet, find the heart rate and the percentage of your heart rate that you're operating at. Cause that's actually probably the best way to ballpark if you're doing a consistent cardiovascular exercise. But honestly, once you then get into like, um, like resistance exercise, or you're in the gym for an hour doing a bunch of different things it gets, it gets very, very noisy for the amount that, um, and your watch tries to estimate that just not, not just on the heart rate, but on the movement patterns from mm -hmm. the accelerometer. And so even then I think it might not be valid <laughs> to, 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 to estimate, to estimate that. But I think again, you almost, it's almost worth the, I mean, this is the way I would think about it is not relying on the calorie count from your device, but just almost just doing a very crude ballpark based on what you did. And, and I mean, you could just Google that. And I think that will probably give you a little bit closer than, you know, your, cause a lot of times if your device is trying to do something super specific, it might be, um, yeah, it might be different modalities might, might, might confound it. So, yeah. But if it's the same, if it's the same exercise modality using the same device, it's probably a decent, a decent, um, gauge at least. Yeah. And I just think that's an important conversation to have because in the, in the non-performance world and just the, the general population fitness community, uh, that is really looked at as the end outcome, which is an entirely different discussion. As I always tell people, you know, we don't, we don't eat calories, we eat food, you know, we don't, we don't burn calories. We move, we do exercise. So I think it, the point you're making is you know, it needs to be taken with a, a grain of salt and needs to be put in a, in the proper context. You know, a lot of these devices, Jeff, get developed from the athletic performance world. You obviously are a very, very high level athlete. Uh, I've been a fitness professional for 23 years. I've worked with runners before that are at a very, very different caliber than clearly what you're at and what some of the athletes are at that these devices are developed for. Talk a little bit for a second about the utility of some of these measures that we're coming up with for athletes to the general public. And then maybe if there's some examples you can think of of the reverse where, you know, things that maybe we would never use for an athlete could be very, very valid and, and contextually important for a general population client. Yeah, that's a, it's a definitely, um, good. There are different, yeah, different kind of use cases for some yeah. of these different devices. And one of the important things, and this gets back to maybe the first question about how you develop the accuracy of these devices is a lot of times when we think about validation studies, we, we think about the smallest detectable difference of a, of a device versus kind of the gold standard. So how, how noisy that device is. So if I have this running pod that measures my mechanics and 
And, you know, one of the, one of the things we measure in running is, is contact time on the grounds, how long your foot. So if our contact time is 200 milliseconds, but the smallest detectable difference on that device is maybe 10 milliseconds. So it means that any output that it gives me could be, it could be 190 or could actually be 210 or anywhere in there. So it, that kind of bandwidth of change of that detectable difference. So a lot of these devices, that's what you have to think about. And, and it's, it's not easy to get that information, but you have to recognize that most of these are not as precise as the gold standard, even if they're accurate, that is they can give over time, they'll give the same average measurement, but that the precision, it could be you know on either side of the true number. So getting back to your question, that smallest detectable difference, I think, is is the is a big is a big indicator for the use case of you know an elite athlete versus a um, you know somebody recreational or something like that. Um, because a lot of times in the elite space, like you're very concerned with minute percent changes. Yeah. Um, and so if you have you know a recreational runner that might see for a given intervention a ten percent change, whereas the elite athlete might see a 1% change, suddenly that 10% change is, is bigger than the smallest detectable difference in this device so mm -hmm. that the device can then be useful because it will actually track the change. So when you're looking at big jumps, um, some of these devices can be helpful for that. So, you know, one that I think of, um, you know, might be, uh, honestly, you know, a good, <laughs> a good, a good one might be, um, uh, so, so thinking of a device an elite athlete might use that, that, uh, recreational might not would be an endurance space, like a lactate meter. So there are a lot of, there's an, been an, an explosion of availability of portable lactate meters, which are, um, you know, for any of your listeners, like lactate is a response to, you know, anaerobic demands and running so, or not running all, all endurance sports, aerobic sports. Um, so those can be really helpful for telling you where along the aerobic spectrum you're operating and, and better tailoring your training. So for an elite athlete, like that can be a very helpful way to pinpoint if I'm at two millimoles of lactate versus three millimoles of mm -hmm. lactate, different training responses. Not so, you know, not, not quite as critical for, um, a recreational athlete. Moreover, there could be solutions out there that can help the recreational athlete get there without the burden of, of using those meters. So that gets back to then like something like a heart rate monitor. Mm -hmm. So a heart rate monitor might be really good for a recreational athlete to kind of tailor the, you know, broad strokes of their, of their monitoring their, their exercise program. Whereas for the elite athlete, the day-to-day -day variations in heart rate, like if they are say that two millimoles of lactate correspond to 155 beats per minute on some days, but your heart rate based on, you know, your hydration status, uh, you know, day-to-day -day weather, even some maybe noise in the, in the heart rate measurement might fluctuate by a few beats per minute. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking for a very specific intensity, that lactate measurement is much easier to, or it's much more, it's more accurate to dial in on that exact yeah. physiological response. Whereas the, you know, the recreational athlete, it might be less critical that you're operating at 152 versus 158 beats per minute or something like that. So that idea of kind of the ease of use versus granularity of the data is important. Another one might be those, you know, thinking about like getting back to those mechanical metrics in, in running for a, an athlete, not just an elite athlete, but if you've, if you've been training for a long time in the same modality, your, your movement patterns are going to be relatively robust mm -hmm. um, if you've been healthy. And so those, those metrics might not, they're, they're not going to they're not going to move much and they're not going to be that informative, but for somebody just starting, that might be a really interesting, you know, piece of technology to kind of monitor your growth patterns. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe not necessarily intervening on them, but just keeping an eye on, on how they progress as you build up an exercise routine or something like that to kind of baseline baseline what's, you know, what's normal for you. So, Yeah. Yeah, very, very helpful. And again, it, it is a lot about, it's about context and it's, it's about practicality and ease of use. And I think it, this is not just true in exercise, but I think every aspect of our society nowadays, it, it is information overload. And if that overload causes so much inertia that you don't act, 
uh, particularly when we're talking about the, the general population that tends to not be very active in the first place, then that, that's a net negative, not a, not a net positive. I'm curious to help uh, get some help summing this up because we, we just heard a lot. And I, I think, again, all of this is fascinating, but I think the user or the listener, I should say, is kind of left with, okay, well, Jeff, what do, what do I do with the wearables out there? Like, how should I consider these in my day-to-day practice as a fitness and a wellness professional? If you could sum up everything that we just talked about into maybe an actionable soundbite for our listeners with regard to how they should view wearable technologies, what would it be? Be that the, the data that it gives you is probably a little bit noisy. So you have to take it, use it in broad strokes, thinking any single measurement Um, don't, you know, don't bet the house on it. Um, take it, use it as use it maybe for trends longitudinally Mm. assessed. So, so if you're going to use a piece of wearable tech, think, just think of whatever number it gives you and think it could be, you know, one or two ticks higher or one or two ticks lower in actuality. So always thinking of that kind of potential variance in the measurement. So that's one kind of broad stroke. Um, the other is asking if, if you had a perfect, you know, try and research what the gold standard of that device is, and then understand if you had the gold standard, would it be a useful measurement? Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of those two things of the, you know, the interpretation and the, um, the, the, I would say the crude assessment of its efficacy, those two things are, are very important. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's that's incredibly spot on and very, very practically applicable for our users. I'm always keen to ask people like you that are involved in research, what excites you in the space that you're in? And I, I'm even more keen to ask this to you because this is a space with such rapidly emerging technology. What are you most excited about right now? Honestly, I, I am actually really excited about the... Um, the, you know, some of these technologies, um, becoming approaching lab standards, Mm -hmm. um, because there are, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of tech that's kind of junk, but there's a lot that do give us pretty good data. So, like Mm -hmm. I said, even the evolution of the heart rate from the wrist, when it first appeared in watches six, seven years ago, it was pretty noisy and not Mm -hmm. great. But now in a lot of cases, it works pretty well. And so this, this idea that we're approaching, you know, accuracy and precision and the other thing, those calorie expenditures, that's another thing that's evolved rapidly is, is these, these companies have gotten pretty good with their algorithms that the, you know, the calorie expenditures might be in the range of the, you know, that plus minus 10% or something like that for certain devices. Um, So I think the, the evolution of um, the precision is, is pretty exciting. Um, for me personally, you know, there are now some devices that I can measure mechanical metrics, um, of a runner, like ground characteristics that, that might actually be useful for longitudinal monitoring, um, that are approaching good accuracy. So I think that the, what's exciting for me is, is approaching, approaching lab, lab quality tech or lab quality measurements. Um, and again, it's evolving rapidly, but the other thing that I think is really exciting for me as, as kind of a, from a data science perspective, um, cause I, I love statistics and statistical modeling is, is using a large volume of this data over time. So getting back to what I was saying for, for your listeners about not putting too much weight in any one measurement. Well, if the measurement is accurate, but just noisy, then if we have trends over a long period, it can actually tell us maybe a good story about, um, about an athlete. And, and so being able to measure day to day relatively non-invasively, if you could get a year's worth of somewhat noisy measurement on person, on a person, it could be a lot more useful than one or two lab visits, even if that those lab visits are very high quality. So for an example like that, you know, I'm working on a, I mean, algorithm and, and process to, assess the characteristics of a runner using their stride rate characteristics. Mm -hmm. And I was able to kind of show that, you know, I developed a stress fracture early last year in my, in my tibia to show, you know, before 
you know, at the onset of the stress fracture, big changes in, you know, my day-to-day stride characteristics. Mm. Then after I rehabbed the kind of, um, as it progressed back to my normal habitual pattern, that if I were to do that in a lab, it'd be a lot of work to go in the lab and get that, you know, just to, just to get a couple good measurements like that. But because it was, a it was data that I was collecting, um, there, there was no burden. It was all being done in my watch without anything. I could just go back and, and kind of look at this and, and get that individualized signature. I think we can learn a lot more about ourselves painting in those broad kind of longitudinal trends with these data. So that, that kind of longitudinal analysis of, of data, if it's non-invasive and critically, if it's accurate, even if it's a little bit noisy, is, is very exciting. Yeah, we're, we're bringing the lab into the real world, which I think that's a very encouraging trend. Where can people go if they want to find out more about you and the work that you're doing at the Exercise and Sports Science Initiative? So you can find, you know, we have we have a website through, you know, through the university. Um, and so there's, you know, that has links to some of our different activities. Um, and then sometimes when we when you know, we're recruiting for studies, we post there. Um, so there's there's that. And then, you know, my personal I have a personal website if you want to see links to my publications or, you know, things I write or kind of interviews or things like that. And that's just jeffreyburns.com. Then I'm also on Twitter and, and Instagram as well. So yeah. awesome. And we will link up to all of those in the show notes page. Certainly there's so much, it's kind of consistent with the topic we're talking about. There's so much information that these wearables collect that I feel like there's so much information we can talk about in one episode. I'll, I'll say on behalf of all of our listeners, we're probably going to have to have you back at least once a year just to give us the latest update on, on the wearable tech. But this, is, this has been a great conversation, Jeff, and I think really, really level setting in terms of how we should view uh, this proliferation of, of wearable technology. Before I let you go, uh, I want to ask you the question that I always end the podcast on, and uh, we've never had anyone from the data science wearable world answer this question, so I'm keen to, to get your insight on it. And the thesis behind this podcast, The Wellness Paradox, is it's the, it's the gap in trust and interaction and communication between fitness and wellness professionals and medical professionals. From your perspective, if you were to give fitness professionals one advice about what they could do to close off that gap, what would it be? Oh, the gap between fitness and medical. Um, honestly, I think the, the number one thing that you can do is, you know, walk in their shoes, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> take your fitness professional to work one day or take your medical professional to work one day. Um, I, I've been fortunate and, and I think this actually informs some of my, um, my ability to be impactful in my research and, and even as like a data scientist, um, is understanding the populations and contexts in which you are using or prescribing things. Yeah. And so that, you know, that's a two-way street for, you know, fitness professionals and medical professionals. Um, you know, how many, how many doctors have spent much time in, you know, a PT clinic or something like that. Moreover, you know, how many, you know, PTs or ATs um, have really, you know, busted their chops in, in a, you know, in the medical setting um, I think that understanding, understanding the, the, the populations, because what ends up happening is, you know, you spoke to this at the start of these silos and you, you, you start to form your impressions just based on what you see every day and the, the communities that you interact with and you become oblivious to everything going on around you or that, you know, that there could be enormous other populations or use cases or, things like that, that you're just not considering. And so getting back to what I was saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer, scientist, everything, but like, I, I mean, I've grown up in the running world. My, my dad was a coach and a race director. So I grew up in that population, but I, I spent, you know, through all of high school and college, I worked in a running store. Mm -hmm. And so there I was dealing with, you know, not just the elite athletes that might've been on my team or racing against, but also people who are looking to pick up running for the first time or people who had just picked up running for the first time and had an injury and wanted a shoe or people who run two to three days a week. So this enormous spectrum. And that just, I mean, it's like, you think like it blows my mind and especially in the running research space is like, there are so many researchers who come in who have, you know, never trained at a high level and are very focused on, you know, certain populations. And on the flip side, there are some researchers that come in because they love the high level, Mm -hmm. but have no context of, you know, people that are just 
there for, you know, fitness goals or doing it, you know, one to two times a week or something like that. And so just understanding the, yeah, understanding the, the other worlds, it just gives you a whole nother dimension. It's mm. like, um, I, yeah, I can't, I can't speak to it enough, but the, the one thing you could do is like, just try, like, just going and spending some time in the environment that they work. I still, to this day, will go to running stores and just mm -hmm. hang out for a little bit <laughs> and just observe the interactions of the runners just to like, I call it like keeping, 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 uh, keeping my hand on like the thermometer, like taking yeah. the temperature of the running community. And so just going in, yeah, just going in the shoe stores, I think is like, yeah, it, it's a, it's a nice breath of fresh air from, cause I get so caught up in what, what research is going on, what research questions I'm asking. Again, you want to avoid becoming a hammer, finding a nail you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you don't want to be looking for the nails. You want to be looking for the, like the woodworking projects that need to be done. And <laughs> so, so yeah, just spending time in, in the other pop, you know, in the other sectors, if you can. Well said, understanding each other, very important, but fundamental concept. Jeff Burns, thank you so much for joining us on the wellness paradox. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, and happy to, happy to come back anytime to talk about updates, um, as they pertain to any of this stuff. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jeff as much as I did. If you found it insightful and informative, please do share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares really make a difference. Any additional information we'd like to share with you from this episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode four six. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And if you have a moment, please do leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again next week, please be well.